My name is Jonathan White, and I'm uh, at the European Institute here at the LSE, and I'm very pleased here uh, to welcome Elif Shafak to the LSE for this evening's uh, talk. Elif is an award-winning British-Turkish novelist and the most widely read female author in Turkey. She writes in both Turkish and in English and has published 17 books, 11 of which are novels. Her work has been translated into 50 languages. Shafak holds a PhD in political science and has taught at various universities in Turkey, the US and the UK, including at St. Anne's College, Oxford, where she's an honorary fellow. She's a member of WeForum Global Agenda Council on Creative Economy and a founding member of the European Council on Foreign Relations. An advocate for women's rights, LGBT rights, and freedom of speech, Shafak is an inspiring public teacher, public speaker, and twice a TED Global speaker, and I'm told each time receiving a standing ovation. Shafak contributes to major publications around the world, and she's been awarded the title of the Chevalier des Arts et des Lettres. And in 2017, she was chosen by Politico as one of the 12 people who would make the world better. She's judged numerous literary prizes and is chairing the Welcome Prize 2019. For those Twitter users in the audience, the hashtags for today's event are hashtag New World Disorders and hashtag LSE Festival. I would, of course, uh, likely to put your phones onto uh, silent mode so as not to disrupt the event, which is being recorded. It should hopefully ultimately become a podcast and indeed also a video. So Ellie's going to talk for 20, 30 minutes, depending how we go, and then we're going to open up for questions from the audience at that point. So, Ellie. Thank you so much. <clears throat> I really appreciate it. So, where, where shall I talk? There or here? Which, which place is better? There is better. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. I, um, I have such fond memories of my last visit to LSC, and I really still to this day very clearly remember the, the diversity, the honesty of the questions from, from the audience. So I'm really very much looking forward to that. That's why I don't want to have a very long talk. I don't want to keep my own talk very long, and I'd rather open the floor together uh, and, and carry on with your questions, your comments. If you don't you disagree with what I say, please feel free to express. But I'm really looking forward to your, to your thoughts. Um, so our title is How to Remain Sane in the Age of Populism. And it might sound as if I have the answer, but I don't. <laughs> but it's a question that I ask myself often. It's a question that I care about. And I think there's so many uh, pressures individually, culturally, socially, on so many of us, that to me it's an important question, how to remain sane, how to remain balanced in an age that is very much characterized by uncertainty. But to be honest, I also thought about naming this talk, optimists ruin the world, maybe pessimists will save it. And the reason why I'm saying that is because you'll remember until not that long ago, um, there was so much optimism in the air, in every discipline, in academia, in media, article after article written, book after book written, all these predictions about um, a much more democratic, much more liberal world, you know. I want to take you back to that time and I want to think about those days. So what happened 1989, you will remember, uh, although there are many young faces here as well, but th these are milestones in, in world history, the fall of the Berlin Wall, and then the Soviet Union a couple of years later, uh, the day the, the, the flag with the hammer and sickle came down, was lowered for the first time, and the Russian tricolor flag went up. You know, all those momentous transformations 
Um, and there was, in general, this optimism in the air that liberal democracy had triumphed, right? Um, that fascism had withered away, that nationalism was going to lose its appeal in the long run anyhow. Um, and, and basically, liberal democracy seemed to be the only viable way, especially after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Many people claim that. And there was also, I think, the feeling that history could only move forward in a linear way, even though we had enough experience and enough memory, right, to know that that's not true, that history doesn't always necessarily move forward. There's, tomorrow is not necessarily going to be more developed or better than today. Actually, this was one of the questions that troubled uh, people like Walter Benjamin, right? Frankfurt School thinkers, many people who had experienced the rise of ultranationalism, militarism in Germany, racism, you know, in xenophobia. These are the questions that they thought about a lot. Uh, I remember Walter Benjamin's this amazing article about, uh, maybe you've seen the, the painting of Paul Klee when he talks about this painting of, of the angel of history how the angel is looking at the past, but there's this very strong storm blowing from the paradise and the angel moves towards that future in a very uncontrolled, unbalanced way. And Benjamin says, this is what we call progress. So we are moving towards the future, but how much of that <coughs> movement we are in control, that was a big question mark, even back then. And I believe it's even more so today. So there was that kind of optimism that history had to move forward, that there would always be um, a, a progress. And I think there was another kind of optimism, especially the one that we've seen in America with Obama's election, of course. Article after article was written predicting that we were now, America was now a post-racial society. Remember that they had moved over the legacy of racism. Even though there were political scientists at the time who were saying, wait a minute, you know, the data doesn't necessarily confirm that. Actually, what we're seeing is a polarization along racial lines, but their voices were in the minority. So again, there was a very big optimism with regards to how humanity was overcoming racism, how humanity was overcoming sexism. These old troubles of the last century were going to disappear one by one. But I think the biggest optimists back then were the tech optimists. And the tech optimists did not only come from the Silicon Valley, they came from everywhere. Again, I remember reading many articles, particularly about the region where I come from, the Middle East, uh, how the, the rebellions or the, the uprisings in Iran were going to be a Twitter revolution, right? So Iran was Twitter revolution. How the Arab Spring was going to be the Facebook revolution. And you will remember the story of the Egyptian father who named his baby daughter Facebook in honor of the, of the network. So there is a young woman right now who is named Facebook and who was named so because of that kind of optimism and trust. And there was much more trust back then. So the idea was we were all going to become one big global village thanks to the, the transformation or, the, or, or how the exchange of information, knowledge, capital was going to move, we were going to become much more connected and nation states were going to lose their power. So that was back then. And fast forward today, I think what we're witnessing, experiencing is almost the exact opposite. A very widespread pessimism. I believe this is the age of anger in many ways. It is the age of anxiety, angst, an almost existential one. It's an age in which resentment, there's a lot of resentment, bitterness, and polarization. And again, it's an age in which um, politics very much is guided by emotions, but also is misguided by emotions. It's also interesting to me because, again, I think particularly until 2016, there was this unstated perception that some parts of the world were turbulent, like the country where I come from, Turkey. Those were the liquid lands. Those were the places that needed you know, human rights. And those were the places where you had to be a feminist. But the Western world was regarded as more solid, more safe, more steady. So this distinction between solid lands versus liquid lands 
has also been shattered around 2016. And that's why I think we all now know that just like Zygmunt Bauman predicted much earlier, we're all living in liquid times. There's no such thing as solid lands versus liquid lands. But of course, all of that <coughs> creates anxiety. And my worry is the more anxious we feel, the more we long for security. The more things look compli complicated, the more we look for simplicity. And people who claim to have simple answers to our questions are, are gaining power. In other words, demagogues. It is the age of the populist demagogue. One other thing that is contributing to this um, landscape is, I think, the distinction between, and I make a triple distinction there, between information, knowledge, and wisdom. I believe we have a lot of information, too much information, and we just don't say this because it doesn't sound right, because it's a fancy thing to have information. Now we think we know everything, and if we don't know it, we can just Google it, and we can catch up in a few minutes. But that's not knowledge, that's information. And unfortunately, knowledge is very different than information, to such an extent that too much information actually can lessen our knowledge, can lessen our grasp of a subject. And then wisdom, I believe, is something else altogether, because wisdom needs not only knowledge, but emotional intelligence. It needs empathy. It needs the ability to be someone else, to put ourselves in the shoes of another person. So <clears throat> there is that distinction going on. But at the same time, especially now, after 2016, we're dealing with a deluge of misinformation. So already we were finding it difficult to deal with a bombardment of information, but now we have to deal with misinformation as well. And the tech world, despite the optimism of back of those days, and despite the fact that it did have a bright side, we now know it has a dark side as well. So I think the uh, digital world is a bit like the moon, you know, the bright side, but now it's time to talk about this dark side as well. It promised to make us more connected, but now we are far more tribalistic, right, in the digital world as well. It's, it promised to have a more decentralized network, but actually it's quite centralized to such an extent that we can talk about tech monopolies. It talked about diversity and freedom, but what happened in reality is far from that. And even when you look at the numbers in Silicon Valley, um, only 1%, 1 to 2% of people who actively work in Silicon Valley today are, for instance, African Americans. Only 2% Hispanic. Only 15% women. So mostly it is an, it is non-diverse world, even within the Silicon Valley. But what worries me most is this, the other side, the dark side that we haven't talked about. Because I think it is affecting our politics, it is affecting our political language, uh, and it is making, in a way, everything much more inflamed. So moving forward, when there's so much happening, and when we live in an age when tribalism now is on the rise, ultranationalism on the rise, Religious fundamentalism is very much on the table again, and sexism has not disappeared, and homophobia has not disappeared. How do we move forward without, and this is what I want to discuss, without retreating into tribes of the like-minded? Because I believe answering someone else's identity politics is not by withdrawing into another type of identity politics. When we do that, we end up having clashing tribes, clashing identity politics. And I believe that's not the way forward. So what I put my energy into is the culture of coexistence, the culture of shared values. I think we have all entered an age in which all of us, in our own way, in our own personal way, have to become activists for human rights, have to become for activists for democratic values, core issues, and maybe we have entered an age in which none of us has the luxury anymore to become non-political. But when I claim this, I'm not talking about party politics, I'm not talking about partisan politics, which I don't like at all. And I think this two-party system is not answering our needs either. 
What we long for is a new type of language, is a new narrative that goes beyond these divisions. My worry is, if we lose that coexistence, if we lose those bridges one by one, just like we've seen in Turkey, just like we are seeing in Hungary and Poland and country after country, all the way to Brazil, all the way to Venezuela, to the Philippines, the list is so long now. When societies become extremely polarized, when societies become bitterly politicized and people stop talking to each other and people act as if someone who doesn't agree with my political views is my enemy, the moment we come to that point, the only people who benefit from that are the populist demagogues at the top. They love that. You know, they love that kind of duality. So for me, it's very important to, to think about coexistence, to think about progressive values without retreating into identity politics, without retreating into our own um, tribes. And I believe stories can, in a, in, in, a, in a way, play a role as well, because it is through stories that we shift our angle a little bit, even if for a few hours. You know, when we read a novel, we slow down. And to me, that's very important, because most of our energy throughout the day is constantly seeping out. We're in the company of people, we're rushing from one place to another. But when we read a book, when we read a novel, a story, we go within. You know, we go to that inner garden. And I don't think it's a coincidence that totalitarianism, fascism, all kinds of extremist ideologies are based on collectivistic identity. They need synchronized energy of thousands of people, hundreds of people, and to erase individuality. What art can do, and hopefully must do, in my opinion, is to restore that individuality, but not a self-centered individuality, not a selfish individuality, but the kind of individuality that connects with the other, that connects with humanity, that connects with people who are different than me, and makes me realize maybe a little bit better that I'm not that different, in fact. And I want to give a small example that stayed with me. I was very young. I was a high school student, actually, in Turkey. And I had gone through years and years of you know, education system in, in Turkey, which is quite nationalistic, um, and was also back then. So I had a basic interpretation of the Ottoman Empire, of Ottoman history in my mind as a, as a young student. And one day, one weekend, I started reading a novel by Ivo Andrić, the, the Bridge Over the Drina. And I remember it very vividly. I felt very uncomfortable, you know? It disturbed me because there was particularly one scene in which two peasants from the Balkans were talking about Ottoman history, about the Janissary system. And one of them was very positive about it, because as you may know, through the Janissary system, uh, very poor boys had the chance to go all the way up and even become viziers. So he was saying, you know, thanks to the Janissaries, the system, our poor boys were able to excel. But the other one was saying, at the expense of what? You know, they were never able to go back. Their identity was erased. They were never able to see their mothers again, their families, all these Christian boys from the Balkans, collected um, and taken to Istanbul. I had never, never thought about it that way. The reason why I'm sharing this with you is because it, it makes you realize, reading stories, that there is no such thing as history with a capital H that is an absolute truth for everyone. You know, even this talk, we will remember it differently when we leave this place, each and every one of us. But imagine the diversity of interpretations. So that, to me, was a very important moment. It helped me to realize, how does the story change if I shift my angle a little bit? If I put myself in the shoes of another person? And as a writer, that guided me a lot. So when I wrote my historical novels, I always tried to understand Yes, we talk about the Ottoman Empire, but how would the empire feel in the eyes of an maybe Armenian silversmith or a Jewish miller or a concubine in the harem or a prostitute who had to accompany the, the army on their marches? So when you start asking these questions and think about the individuals in a given context, then again, it becomes easier to understand that there is no such thing as absolute history. So 
in my opinion, we, we need this multiplicity of voices. We need to get out of our, out of our echo, uh, echo chambers. And I know it's very hard, especially when politics is very divisive, and especially when we feel, you know, when we're angry at the way in which uh, demagoguery is taking hold. But to me, we have to make a, in my opinion, we have to make a very clear distinction between our criticism of the populist elites who are uh, exploiting people's feelings, emotions in country after country, and then the people who have lots of anxieties about lots of things. I want to be able to communicate. I want to be able to listen. I want to be able to go beyond my echo chamber. Uh, and that's where I want to, that's where I want to leave this talk, if, if I may. How do we move forward? How do we remain balanced, connected with our humanism? How do we stay away from clashing identity politics and perhaps talk about multiple belongings? Because I think all extremist ideologies at the end of the day, wherever they're coming from, they want to narrow us down to one singular identity, right? Are you a Muslim? Just be a Muslim. Are you this? Just be that. Are you a woman? That. But to me, to me, we are more than that. We have all multiple belongings. When I look at myself, I know in my heart I am an Istanbulite, and I will always be an Istanbulite. I'm very attached to the city, but I'm also attached to the Aegean, the Balkans, the Mediterranean. I'm a European by birth. The values that I share over the years, I have become a Londoner. All of those belongings matter to me. And despite what politicians say, we can be world citizens. We can be global souls. Um, the other is more you know, divisive once we retreat into that kind of polit identity politics. And also, I want to add this, I don't think it's progressive either. And this is what I fear we have lost. When I look at 1970s, late 1960s, 1970s, feminist movement, for instance. Uh, I, I lived in Boston for a while, and to me it had a big, big impact, particularly African-American women's movement in that area. And many of those women back then, because they came from uh, lower classes or more disadvantaged backgrounds, they were very much aware of class discrimination and elitism. Because they were black, they were very much aware of racism. Because they were women, they were very much aware of sexism. Many of them came from LGBT minority backgrounds. They were very much aware of homophobia, transphobia, and other kinds of discrimination. So when I read their work, there's almost a manifesto for diversity of, of belongings. When you read people like Audre Lorde, the way she says, you know, look at me, I'm a woman, I'm a poet, I'm a mother, um, I'm black, I'm this, I'm that, and I'm many more things that you might not be able to see at first glance, but I have those multitudes within. I think that is what we're losing today when we retreat into clashing tribes. To be able to say, I am many things. I have multiple belongings. And that doesn't mean that I can't be patriotic. It just means I'm not nationalistic, right? It doesn't mean that I have no love or emotional care, attachment for the culture that I come from. Actually, I care about it but I don't want to be withdrawn into tribes. So these are the differences that I care about, and I think and I hope they will help us to remain a little bit more balanced, a little bit sane uh, in an age such as ours. Thank you. Great, thanks very much indeed, Elif. We're going to open out to uh, questions. I think we'll take them in groups of uh, possibly three, and if you could keep them uh, fairly succinct, that'll allow everyone who wants to to have a, a chance to speak. So do put up your hand if you'd like to uh, come in, and I saw the guy at the back there first of all, so we'll start with the gentleman in the white shirt. Hey, thank you for uh, taking the time to speak with us today. Um, I was wondering, you mentioned this polarization of society. What do you think are the main causes driving this polarization? Thank you. Okay. Let's take two more. Yes, a lady down the front here. Uh, 
Um, I was wondering whether you'd do better to say how to remain sane in the age of patriarchy. Because I think this is all the rise of an old established order kicking back against the progress that ethnic minorities, women and what have you, have made in the 60s, 70s, 80s. Yeah. So people like Putin and Trump and Brexit and what have you, right across the Eastern European, is just the re-establishment of male supremacy. Thank you. And let's take something from this. Yeah. There's, I think, a hand at the top. <coughs> thank you. Um, thank you for your a most um, illuminating and sympathetic talk uh, to my views. Um, I speak as a, a member of a Witten. Uh, we're called the Mercia Acting Witten. Uh, we already declared independence for the Mercia region uh, some 12 years ago because we knew then, and I knew much earlier than that, that the only hope for preventing the utter chaos that we're in now is that we have local control and we get power flowing from the bottom to the top, not from the top to the bottom. And I hope you would agree with me that populism is a smear which is delivered against the voters who oppose these top-down diktats. You had a better word for it than me. Mm -hmm. um, moguls, I think. And um, my point is, unless we do have local control where the jewels of the crown on any single dynasty's head are taken away and distributed around the parishes of England and Europe. We will never have a united kingdom and we will never have a united Europe. They don't exist now and they will never exist. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Um, shall I try to maybe connect because I think there are there are major connections uh, between the, the questions what what has changed uh, I think it's the year 2019 and still we're not fully talking about inequality but we have to talk about inequality and and I think it has to be at the center of our debates not only as a political issue but also as a moral issue so when we look back, it just didn't start with Trump. It didn't start with or Viktor Orban. It started earlier. Since 1980s onwards, this neoliberalism, this unrestrained free market ideology, uh, this fetishization of profit, greed, it, it has major consequences in politics, in society. Imagine, ever since 1984 onwards, the median income household in America has been stagnant. It, it hasn't moved on. But in that time, in that period, the 1% that was already very privileged, they have doubled. They, and I'm only talking about their income. So what's happening is the gap between the middle class and that people at the top, the elite, is opening up. That is why we need to understand that populism, unfortunately, claims to have an answer to some very real problems. The problems are real, but populism is not the answer. And it's just going to make everything worse, as we have seen in country after country. Because at the heart of populism, there's always a division between us and them. This is their energy. This is the way it, it, it flourishes. And the us is defined as the pure people, and the them is defined as the, as the elite, right? But when you scratch the surface a little bit, a populist will never embrace entire people. They will always be talking for some people. Uh, remember one of Trump's uh, famous speeches throughout the campaign? He said, what matters is the unity of the people. In the second sentence, he said, as for the other people, they don't matter. That, that is the, the summary of, of a populist mentality, the other people. And you can very easily find yourself categorized as the other people because you're a minority or because you disagree with their views. Anyone, everyone who is, doesn't fit into their definition of the real people, 
will be the other people and not the important ones. So it divides. It always divides. We have seen this in Turkey under Erdogan. We have seen this in almost every populist country. And then when they talk about the elite, again, there is a hypocrisy there because populists don't have a problem with, the, with the elites as long as they are the elites. They love to claim, they love to act as if they are not elite. When I look at Marine Le Pen, when I look at Geert Wilders, when I look at Nigel Farage, you know, people who come from very privileged backgrounds, they're either part of the pop, uh, political elite or the financial elite. And yet they like to claim we're with the people. So according to a populist, the definition of elite has nothing to do with wealth. It has nothing to do with privilege. It has everything to do with values. So if you, are, if you happen to be a student with liberal values, with liberal democratic values, or a teacher you know, who finds it very hard to have a house in central London because you can't afford it, but you happen to have liberal democratic values, then you are an elite. But people who come from hedge fund you know, backgrounds, from financial industry, uh, and happen to be populist demagogues, they are not elite, they are the people. Because their values are the right values. So it's, there's a lot of hypocrisy, there's a lot of fog, and I think we need to be very careful about all that. But many things have changed. And I, I fully share with you, it, there's, a, there's an amazing backlash to all the progressive steps that were taken. And that is why we need to understand that we can't take anything for granted. Even in this country, we can find, because what countries like Turkey have shown us is how history can move backwards very fast. The slide, when it accelerates, it happens very fast. And even the most basic freedoms can, can disappear. But at the same time, I think we need to understand several things are changing to make people more anxious. One is demographics. And I don't believe we in liberal, more left, democratic, progressive, whatever you call it, circles talk about this enough. The change in demographics, when I look at a country like Bulgaria, it is predicted in the year 2040 to, to lose a very significant percentage of its overall population because there isn't enough growth, you know, population growth. But then when I look at countries like America, in several places, even now in America, several states like Texas, California, uh, those states are now minority majority states. In the year 2050, and that's not far away, America is going to become a minority majority country. For the first time, the whites, the white population is not going to be the, the majority anymore. Now this has a psychological effect. And if we can't find a new narrative that connects with that demographic change and offer a better alternative, I am worried that people are going to be moving more and more towards populists and tribalists because that's where they feel safer. And of course, another change, I don't want to go on and on, but that we need to talk about, and people like Yashamung actually talk about, write about, is uh, the change in, in the way we get our knowledge. And I tried to touch upon that a little bit. But while we're reading mainstream media, there's another media that's growing here in the digital world. And to a large extent, that is in, triggered by far right, by tribalist, uh, populist narrative, we're not perhaps looking at that enough, but it has a huge impact. And that worries me too. So that's why I think we need to become more active citizens, not only in the public space here, but also in the digital space, and keep an eye on what's happening. Thank you. Let's take some more questions. Thank you. Um, a lot of the problems of our future, uh, they'll, <clears throat> they'll be more global in nature. So for example, climate change and uh, the uncontrolled use of data and artificial intelligence. So as such, <clears throat> do you feel that the fall of populism is in some ways inevitable because in the future, the problems we face will be so global that sort of isolationism would no longer work? Thank you. In the middle at the back there. Thank you for your inspiring words. 
And my question is related with the media. Because, uh, for example, the use of Twitter, because uh, we can use in a free way just to express our opinion, but at the same time could be like uh, used by, by this populism just to uh, spread the fake news. So how to deal with this, with this media, specifically with Twitter? Thank you. And the lady in the middle. Thank you. Um, last night in the lecture, there was a question, is the left-right divide still relevant? Mm. How would you answer this from the multiple belongings narrative? Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, you know, Marine Le Pen, sh she says, there's no more left and, and right in France. There's the main division is between um, Patriots who love their country and globalists. That's, that's the way she frames it. Many people across the ideological spectrum are constantly questioning left-right. Uh, of course, I very much disagree with everything she does. But I think uh, the left-right division is in, in many ways doesn't satisfy us. One reason is not because those political divisions are not real, they are very much real, but the party politics, the party structure is what doesn't satisfy people. By saying that, again, I'm talking about inequality. Until not that long ago, in this country, and I'm sure many people will remember it, when you looked at labor MPs, many of them came from uh, either working class backgrounds or they had very strong roots in trade unions or they had grown up in towns where there had been a very strong trade union culture. And even uh, if you looked at the, the conservatives, they also had very strong ties in agricultural communities. They came also from, from those backgrounds. That no longer is the case. More and more MPs in either party started to become like each other. They're all privileged, they all go to same schools, they all have some same kind of advantages. And so what's happening is as they're becoming similar to each other, the gap between them and their voters is expanding. That is why I think party politics should not satisfy us. And we need a new narrative that should go beyond that. Um, with, with regards to the, what do we do on social media? I, I really find it very important. In, in this city, Westminster attack happened, another attack of terrorism. And you remember the tweets that were circulating? Uh, one young woman wearing a headscarf, and immediately someone was saying, oh, she doesn't even care, she's just looking at her phone. And then we realized that wasn't the truth at all. But this misinformation, this spread of slander, this spread of, uh, again, a uh, very dangerous kind of antagonism, we have to be very careful about that. Who is spreading which lies and for what purpose? And I know it's very difficult because everything is anonymous, but we need to be alert, aware, in my opinion, citizens, digital citizens as well. Another example, uh, you will remember throughout the elections in France, uh, Macron, there was a moment when Macron was speaking with people on the streets and they went, he went to a factory, a fish factory. And, and uh, some of the workers, some workers were washing eels and gutting them. So he just, he rolls his sleeves and he starts gutting an eel. And then when he's done, because that's a very messy job, he washes his hand and then he shakes hands with all the workers in the room and then he leaves, like many politicians do. What happened was the far right in France took that video, edited that video, so that the previous moment became the posterior moment. They took out the eel, that's a detail, the fish factory. In this new video, which is spread by the far right in France, Macron goes to a factory, he shakes hand with a worker, he looks at his hands and he's disgusted because he's just touched an ordinary person and then he goes and washes his hands. And so the video says the liberals are elitist. And I'm very worried about this because, you know, we, we, what we see is is the truth being attacked. You might disagree with Mac Macron's views. You don't have, I'm, not talk, I'm not saying you, don't have, you have to agree, 
but we have to talk about the reality, what is happening, not some lies and illusions. And it is in that sense that we need to be very much aware of the dark side of social media and uh, how these bots, trolls, anyone who dares to speak up critically, and for people coming from Turkey, people coming from Brazil, Venezuela, Philippines, this is very real. You know, you get all kinds of abuse on social media. And I have to say, if you're a woman, you get it even more. So it's a very sexist platform at the same time. Twitter, even more so. Uh, but what do we do? I don't think we can abandon it fully. How do we use it in a more progressive way? How do we use it in a much more constructive way without losing our humanity uh, and not falling into the traps that the far right is setting up for each and every one of us? Um, did I answer? Is there a question that I... Um, I think there was a... With regards to, sorry, populism is that I, I, I fear it's not going to disappear too soon. I fear it's going to spread, actually, because when I look at the change in demographics, when I look at this income inequality, uh, we also need to talk about immigration and how that is fueling some people's fear of demographics. All of that is very real, right? Uh, when I look at all these data, I, I fear that populism is not going to disappear anytime soon. We might have entered a new age in which we ha we all, we'll, we're all going to go through this for a, for a while. And of course, when I talk about populism, this is a very thin ideology. It's a very weak ideology. Because it's weak, it needs another ideology which is to, to balance itself. In some cases, it is socialism, like we've seen in South America. So there is populist socialism. Uh, but in most of the cases, it needs nationalism. And it unites forces with nationalism. So what, what I fear is we're going to see more and more cases of populist nationalism in Europe as well, across the European continent. And it worries me that, especially along the periphery of Europe, there's this toxic imperial nostalgia that is uh, surfacing in a very strange way. I've seen that in Turkey, this longing for an Ottoman Empire, for a golden age that never was, but we love to believe in it. We see it in Russia, again, this golden you know, period, history, that they want to go back to. Even in a country like Spain, even in Andalusia, people are longingly talking about the good old days of Franco, right? This, this nostalgia in Austria, it's happening and it's very big, that kind of nostalgia in countries like Croatia. Uh, so on and on, I think we need to be very much aware of how history is being, in a way, reinterpreted, reconstructed through a very toxic nationalistic nostalgia, which again, never was. History wasn't like that. And we have to remind people uh, again and again. That's why it's important for us to, to remember, you know, whose history are you talking about? Who tells the story? Who has the right to tell the story? Let's take some more questions. <coughs> man here in the middle first, yep. Dr. Shafak, coming from a country founded on secularism, can you just talk from a Turkish perspective about whether religion and its fairy godmother faith might help people to remain sane in an age of populism? Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. This lady down the front of it. About the video example that you've just given. Uh, okay. The video, Sorry. yeah, yeah. Uh, about the video example. Uh, this is like kind of, um, I mean, since it is kind of the human nature to uh, try to find to believe in things uh, if they want to go one way and all the maybe it's also related with the religion question you all tend to create false memories and mm -hmm. to come together believe in one thing uh, and become part of something uh, maybe um, there's also like about this fake news it's a catastrophe but also they're kind of 
only serving to something, to a need, because people want them because of something I don't know, <laughs> but uh, th th those people who cuts and edits and creates and s sells them uh, to the industry, to the market, mm -hmm. to social media, they're just like kind of uh, workers of the, s <coughs> the, the similar things that the, the, the whole marketing has been using for years just to mm -hmm. buy and just to sell handbags. Mm -hmm. Now they're selling uh, perspectives. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what do you think about that? Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> um, <I made> front. <coughs> Thank you. Um, bouncing back on the religion uh, that was mentioned earlier and also the idea that we need to uh, nourish this coexistence uh, concept. Uh, don't you think that there might be an element of answer in how we need perhaps to rethink how we <coughs> educate ourselves mm -hmm. and how we educate younger generations mm -hmm. in the light of, you know, you were mentioning the political parties not being satisfying anymore, mm -hmm. all the lies and all the misinformation were being fed, would that be an element of answer to remain sane in the age of populism? I'm going to take one Thank extra so question much. because mm -hmm. this is probably going to be our last round of questions. So <coughs> if I could take this uh, man just here, three rows back. Thank you. Um, just a quick one. Isn't the core issue an erosion of trust at all levels? Mm -hmm. And isn't that vacuum of trust and integrity and unaccountability? Mm -hmm. So you see a lot of these people in positions of power, regardless of left or right, who re-elected, who go and continue what we have detested for four years as observers, as you know, uh, voters, but then they get re-elected. So my question to you as um, a, a mm -hmm. gifted <coughs> author and somebody who follows these things is that a, a school of thought says people deserve the governments in certain countries that they are ruled by. What is your reaction to that? And knowing how passionate you are about Rumi, and Rumi says, beyond right and wrong, there is a place and I shall meet you there. That's Haven't right. we failed in creating <coughs> that space and what is the importance and the art of storytelling among leaders which none of them is able to do so in these days yeah, so thank, thank you so much <coughs> thank you thank you i i think that the sad irony is in many countries if not in every country i believe the people are ahead of their governments uh, but they, they lack the power to change those governments uh, that said i'm also aware that in countries especially where authoritarianism takes hold, ultranationalism takes hold, religious fanaticism takes hold, it is also true that the fabric of society after a while starts to get damaged. It affects everything. So it is not a coincidence that in countries where we see a rise in um, authoritarianism, we also see a rise in sexism, in, in patriarchy. It's not a coincidence. That's why I think when we go back, when we slide backwards, women and, and minorities have much more to lose because those are the first people who will start losing their rights. So, uh, nonetheless, I, I believe that civil society is far more complex than, than we can see at the first glance. There are always people who want a better future, a much more democratic future for their children, for their grandchildren but we don't hear their voices. And it's very important to me not to forget that they are there and not to make the mistake that, to think that a government equals the people. Uh, you know, that's, that's, that's not the case. So in many cases, actually, there can be a huge, huge discrepancy. But you're very right about the erosion of trust in media, in politics, in basic institutions. Some of it actually is not, um, is, is quite understandable. Because remember, the financial crisis happened and many experts failed to see it coming. The Arab Spring, again, they failed to read it properly. Uh, the, the Euro crisis happened, again. Um, when Brexit happened, many experts failed to see it coming. Trump, sa same way. So 
many populists go to the people and they say, you know, you don't need experts. You know, you don't need intellectuals. You are the people, and they get, they keep getting everything wrong anyhow. You are the real people. You just trust your gut instincts. You don't need this bunch. But when I hear that kind of rhetoric, I I really wince because I've heard it in Turkey. This anti-intellectual, anti-knowledge rhetoric that I've heard again and again in Turkey. Now I hear it in many other places. <coughs> One other thing maybe that we need to keep in mind, I, I used to live in America, uh, in Arizona for a while, and I remember it very vividly. I used to listen to this uh, right-wing radios a lot. And, 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 and I still listen to such an extent that my YouTube algorithm thinks I'm a white supremacist. <laughs> So I, I listen, you know, what are they saying? What are they reading? Uh, and, and there's a very interesting white supremacist book club, for instance. What are they reading, these, these people? Uh, and back then, years ago, a decade ago, Rush Limbo, in one of his talks, he said, liberal Democrats, progressives, they, have, they control media, they control science, um, and they control politics. So one by one, we're going to create our own alternative media, our own alternative science, and that is the science that now denies climate change and everything. So this idea of creating an alternative, I am not saying that everything with the existing media was okay. It has lots of problems, but at least within that system there was checks and balances. There's some kind of accountability. You know, if a newspaper writes something outrageous, you can sue them. Or at least when you buy um, The Sun or when you buy The Guardian, as a reader, we know what to expect. We, we know the filters. We, 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 we can make our own choices. When I see things on social media, I don't have those filters. It gives the impression of being neutral, but it isn't. It gives the impression of being scientific, but it isn't. Where does all that knowledge come from? So I'm worried about the loss. You know, if in the name of losing trust in one institution, people go to another alternative, that is not trustworthy at all, that would be a major mistake and it will take us all the way back. To me, it's much better to repair the wrongs of liberal democracy, to embrace it, but, but understand its basic flaws and, and, and move forward. So I'm not defending the status quo at all, but all I'm saying is I'm worried that we're losing our trust in democracy, our trust in uh, basic core liberal democratic values, and the price of that might be too high. Yeah. Isn't the language failing us? I mean, the word democracy itself, yeah. it has a rhyme with hypocrisy, but we'll leave that for a second. But haven't the language failed us? You're a gifted author. You know, the definition of democracy itself, back to your point, is mm. debatable. So when mm. you see um, CC extends his uh, yeah. term to 2034 and all the European heads are there, yeah. and the same tension happens somewhere else and there's no peace. Yeah. Yeah. For an observer sitting in East Asia or in Middle East, they say, well, wait yeah. a minute, what democracy are we talking yes. about? Yes, but then we, I, 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 fully, I fully respect your, uh, your point. But then we have to say that's not democracy. That's not democracy at all. And democracy is not also, maybe we need to bear in mind, it's not only the ballot box. A country might have relatively free, relatively regular elections and might still not be a democracy. Because for a democracy to exist and to thrive, in addition to the ballot box, we need rule of law. We need separation of powers. We definitely need a free, diverse media, an independent academia, minority rights, women's rights. Together with all those components, we have a functioning democracy. Now, in countries like Turkey, all those components are gone, and you end up with a ballot box. That system is not a democracy. It is majoritarianism. It is the rule of the majority. Once majoritarianism kicks in, from there into authoritarianism, it's a very swift and short slide. So we need to bear in mind that um, that's not democracy's fault. But again, how do we improve it? How do we, uh, how do we move forward? To me, it's very important to remember Hannah Arendt's uh, teachings, Hannah Arendt's words, maybe I should say, because these people had gone through the worst catastrophes, right? They were very much interested in how do we become more engaged in civic life? Because it's not only about freedoms, it's also about our own duties to each other as human beings, not to any political party, not to any, anything else, but as human beings to each other. So I think it's very important for women to support women 
for you know, civil societies to support other civil societies. And that is the kind of energy that comes from the bottom uh, and, uh, rather than top down. That I find very, very important. Uh, the emotions, we spoke a lot about emotions. I think emotions are incredibly important. We need to put more thought into emotions. And it worries me that political science is underestimating. There isn't enough analysis because it's not measurable. Because we're so data oriented. Everything is about measuring data. But you can't measure emotions in the same way. And yet, emotions are playing a huge role. So the emotions are real. But how do we answer them? How do we deal with them? To me, that's very important. Just, I want to share with you one example. Remember I said, jokingly, this white supremacist book club. In 1973, one French author, he went to south of France. He put his typewriter in front of the window and he looks outside the window and he says to himself, what if they come? And he starts writing a novel. Uh, and it's one of the most horrible novels, one of the most racist uh, novels you can encounter, in my opinion, in world literature. But he writes this novel. It's called The Camp of the Saints. And he imagines boats, ships full of, he says, brown people. That's how he describes it. They come to Europe and they start to invade Europe. And the president of France, in his book, is liberal, a Democrat, so he wants to shoot these refugees, but because he's a Democrat, he says to his army, uh, you make the decision, you know, I leave it up to you. And therefore, the, the, France loses, and Europe loses, the Western civilization loses. And as they say, the brown people come and invade. Now, I'm very sorry to say, but in the year 2011, this book, which was forgotten to a large extent, it became a big bestseller in France, in America. Another book in Germany, it's called Ger Germany uh, Demolishes Itself, is talking about how Turks are going to become demographically more populous. And the writer claims that this is going to diminish Germany's intelligence because Turks are uh, racially more stupid than, than Germans. So these kinds of books, you know, extreme racism, extreme nationalism, this is coming back and we, we need to understand. But we also need to understand the anxieties that are triggering these people or the, this kind of rhetoric. And we need to come up with a better rhetoric, with a better narrative, with a much more humanistic narrative that goes beyond this nationalistic, discriminatory and hateful language. Can faith play an important role? I think it's a, it's a very difficult question, especially in the context of Turkey, because we're not used to talking about faith in a non-polarized way, because we're such a polarized society. You know, it's either um, an, a, a very rigid form of uh, anti-religion uh, or, or an ex rigid form of religiosity that you grow up with. And I find both very problematic. I am not a religious person myself, but I'm someone who's interested in faith, and I'm someone who's very interested in doubt. And I think they need to go hand in hand. You know, to me, that is very interesting. Can they say anything to each other, faith and doubt? Can they dance together? So I think I'm more close to agnostics rather than rigid atheists or very rigid religious people, or to those mystics who were a little bit of misfits. They were walking a very thin line. Uh, between faith and doubt, and they questioned religious teachings all the time. Uh, in a nutshell, I think, you know, it is, faith is too important to leave to extremely religious people. Patriotism is too important to leave to the nationalists. Technology is way too important to leave to only tech people. And democracy is way too important to leave only to politicians. So these are areas in which we can all become much more active citizens. Excellent.